powerful picture of how a small thing can have a massive impact giving it, giving it enough time. And, and we're talking, these, uh, this four-week series, we're talking about the smallest books in the New Testament. In, in the last third of the Bible, the New Testament, uh, in, in, in here are these four books that are only one chapter each, and kind of short chapters. Second John, Third John, Jude, and Philemon are really postcards, just small letters, but these small letters have a massive, huge impact. And we started thinking about that last week, uh, and the themes in 2 John kind of run through to 3 John, because they're written by the same person, by John the Elder. He wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, the Gospel of John, and the book of Revelation. And these two big themes that kind of run through is this theme of love, that, that everything starts with love in the heart of God. And so if you know Jesus, if you believe in Jesus, if you've come to the cross and received Jesus, you walk in love. You live in love. That's just part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. But John also emphasizes in 2 John and in 3 John that we also walk in truth. There are things that we believe, that we hold to, that we're committed to, and so that we also walk in truth and live in truth and stand in truth and hold to the truth. And what we see is this challenge that, that, that for, for many of us, as we're walking, you know, God wants us to walk in this balance, on this balance beam of love and truth. And some of us sort of tend to lean over towards the love side, and we're more comfortable here, and we don't want to deal with truth and boundaries. We want to deal with just loving people right where they're at, and that's the heart of God. But and there's other people that kind of tend to kind of lean over on this side, and, they got, and, and they're kind of truth people, and they want to hold to the truth and believe in the truth, which is great, but they don't show much love along the way. And, and what John is saying to us, what he's saying in the ancient world that comes through to our, our lives today, is he says, okay, it's challenging. Get on that balance beam and stay there. And hold to love and hold to truth. And when you do that, sometimes we learned in 2 John, when you hold to love and hold to truth, sometimes you close the door because there's people who the truth tells you are dangerous to the church, dangerous in belief, dangerous in the choices they make. And there's sometimes you have to wisely close the door. You still are loving, but you hold to the truth. And sometimes you close the door. But in 3 John, we find out that most of the time what we're supposed to do is open the door. And welcome. And embrace. And in 3 John, we're going to discover that there's four different ways that we should be opening the door. When we can. With wisdom, there's still times we need to close the door. But also we need to open the door and show the love of God as we hold to the truth of God. And, and, and so this journey, this, this walk for us is the walk of one who follows Jesus Christ. And so I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to 3 John. And if you, if you have a phone or an iPad, you can open up with a Bible app to 3 John. The whole thing is, is in, in my Bible, it's less than one page. So I'm going to read the whole book of 3 John to you today. And I want to ask you to follow along. And what I want you to try to notice is this concept of hospitality. Because one of the four ways we open our door is we open the door to hospitality. As a church, as Christians, that we're loving, we share what we have, we're hospitable. That's what Christians are. That's what we do now. Last week, John said, hey, there's people traveling around, and there's traveling preachers, and they were false teachers. Be wise, close the door. But if someone's traveling and they love the Lord and they need a place to stay in the ancient world, it was like, open your door, open your home. There were no hotels, there were no restaurants. And so to be gracious, be hospitable. As I read this, notice the theme of hospitality that comes through. Third John, beginning in verse one. The elder, that's John, the elder. To my friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. There it is again, love and truth, right in the first verse. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. It gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth, telling how you continue to walk in it, 
I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. He says, man, nothing makes me happier than I know people, spiritual children, who are walking in the truth of God. Verse five, dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers and sisters. Now hit the pause button there. What he's talking about is they're extending hospitality. He's thanking them for being hospitable, for opening the door of their home, of their hearts, of their resources to help people that are traveling through. Dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers and sisters. Even though they are strangers to you, they came through, they were strangers, but they were Christians, you cared for them. They have told the church about your love. So please now send them on their way in a manner that honors God. It was for the sake of the name that they went out. They went out to bring the name of Jesus to the world, receiving no help from the pagans. Non-believers weren't inviting them in, caring for them, but you did. He said, great job. Verse 8. We ought, therefore, to show hospitality to such people so that we may work together for the truth. Show hospitality. Open the door of your heart. Open the door of your home when it's appropriate and safe to do so. Do that in the name of Jesus. Verse 9. Now, a problem arises. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. Slam in the door. No hospitality. So when I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. And John says, I'm bringing it up. Next time I come, we're going to have a conversation. We're going to get over here to the truth side a little bit. We're going to talk about what's going on here. All right? So he's spreading malicious nonsense about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers. He won't show hospitality. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. The people in the church that say, well, we'll open our home, we'll open our hearts. He says, then you're out of the church. Man, something's gone wrong here. The door is slammed shut when it should be open. Verse 11, dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone and even by the truth itself. We also speak well of him, and you know that our testimony is true. And then his closing thought in verse 13 and 14. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to do it with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we'll talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends here send their greetings. Greet the friends there by name. And you have just heard the entire book of 3 John. He's saying there's times to open the door of your heart and your home and your life. There's times to open all kinds of different doors to show the love of Jesus. So what I want to do in the moments we have together today is I want to make two general observations from from John's writings. In in the Gospel of John, the, the Epistles of John, and the Book of Revelation, there's a couple themes that kind of run through that are big themes. And then I want to look at four big lessons from this one little book. Because there's four different ways that I think we're encouraged to open the door. So I want you to leave here with those four practical ideas of where to open the door when you could open the door with wisdom. But first, two observations. Here's observation number one that comes from reading the, the, the writings of John. That they're inspired through him by the Holy Spirit. First, we notice that God's love for variety. When you read it, you realize that God just has this heart where, where, where the, the, the people that God has created and the work that he does, it always seems to have this beautiful variety. I, I love that when Jesus called disciples, they didn't all look the same. They look very different. As a matter of fact, there, there must have been some interesting over-meal conversations because if you know the backgrounds of the disciples, they weren't, wouldn't have been the easiest group to get together and have get along. Radically different backgrounds. But, but God, call, God, God loves variety. I think of it like flowers. My wife it was born and raised in Holland, Michigan. Uh, she has a, a rich Dutch heritage, and so she loves this particular kind of flower right here. Tulips. And I've seen fields of tulips that were all the same color, and it's beautiful, but when there's something about the diversity and the beauty of, of just, when, God, has made, God has made such beauty. And you just can't look around and not see variety. And God's made us different. Think, think about even our, our taste buds and our palates. Okay, who here loves black licorice? Raise your hand. Okay, praise the Lord. Who here does not like black licorice at all? And yet we still can worship Jesus. See what I'm saying? <laughs> praise the Lord. I mean, Big issues like this, right? Remember, you know those little candies, those little pink and white candies with the black licorice in the middle? Remember what those are called? Good and plain. Some of you love them, and some of you are like, ugh, right? But some of you love red licorice. How about red licorice? Can I get a praise Jesus for red? Okay, yeah. So, but, but God, you know, our, our personalities, our temperaments, we, we, God has made this, this variety in the human family. 
And God delights in that. We should delight in that. And then the other general observation is that God hates disunity. God has a hatred of disunity. In his church, man, God, it breaks the heart of God when God's people can't get along. But I think even in the human family. It doesn't, God loves variety. God understands our differences. There's lots of differences. But it breaks the heart of God when we cannot walk together and talk together and figure things out together. I believe that one of the ways that God has, has given us this like a, a potential tutorial for learning to get along within the variety of different kinds of people is this beautiful picture of a man and woman brought together in marriage and the two will become one. There'll, there'll be one person, a man and a woman. Seriously, God, what were you thinking? Um, we're so dramatically different. I've been married now for over three and a half decades. And I don't, I don't think my wife and I go a week without having some kind of disagreement. Not, not maybe big ones, sometimes bigger ones. But, but, but we see the world so differently and we have so, such, such unique personalities. And, and it, we've said before that except for our love for Jesus in almost every other way, we're different. I, I, how, many, how many people love spicy food? I mean, nose running, eyes watering, give it as spicy as you can, all right? Praise the Lord. Thank you, brothers and sisters. We're a family. How, that, that's me. My wife likes subtle flavors. She'll go, try this. I'm like, there's no flavor. You know, it's because it's subtle, right? But, but some, we make it work. This is, this is the journey. And can I say something? In, in the variety of what God has created and the beauty of that, and, and then in the, in the um, call to walk, at least with respect for each other, and to walk in a sense as a, as a unified human family, if anyone in our world is going to lead the way in being able to say this, to look at someone and say, hey, listen, you know what? I completely disagree with you. We are on opposite ends of the poles, and we don't agree on this, but I love you and I'll respect you. If anyone's gonna be able to say that, it's gonna be followers of Jesus. Because we understand that God, God sent his only son to die for human beings. And, and, and when Jesus, in John chapter three, uh, when, when Jesus meets Nicodemus and then there's teaching afterwards, it says, it says, for God so loved a small group of people who became part of Shoreline Church, God so loved them that he gave his only son. No, for God so loved the world. God's love is massive. And, and within that, there's truth. And, and, and I'm, not, I'm, not talking about, I'm not talking about doctrine. I'm talking about the heart of God, God's starting point. And the Bible says that God longs that none would perish and all would come to the knowledge of salvation. God wants everyone to know Jesus and become part of his family. That's the heart of God. And so, and so if we let disunity you know, kind of control our hearts and guide our lives, it's gonna be a long, hard road of life. And, and, and so can I tell you, that I think there's three kind of, key attitudes that drive towards disunity. And I'm not going to say much about these, but I just want you to hear these and think about these. In the world we live in, we've got to think this through. There's pride. Here's what pride says. I am always right, so you are always wrong. That's pride. I'm always right. Selfishness. I want my way, so you can't have your way. If that drives our hearts, it leads to disunity. Power. I must win so you will lose. And if we, if we live with those kind of attitudes, if we walk with those kind of attitudes, and, and you know what? If those, if those infiltrate and permeate a local church, it will lead to disunity. And there's all kinds of churches that are fighting and, 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 and quibbling and quarreling. There's not a sense of humility and selflessness instead of selfishness and longing for the best for others. The, the heart of Jesus changes us. It doesn't, and here's the beauty, here's the beauty. I can love you and hold to the truth, which means there's gonna be things that I disagree with people on because I believe God's word is clear and there's a place to stand, but as a Christian, I will continue to love people even when I disagree with them in accordance with scripture. Christians have to lead the way in that kind of a lifestyle. Now, four lessons, big lessons, and all four lessons from 3 John are about opening the door to something. And they're all deeply important. If you're a note taker, you can write these down. Here's lesson number one. Big lesson from a small book, number one. There are times to celebrate and pray for people. There are times when we look at a person and we say, I need to pray for you. I need to lift you up before the Lord. I love this little prayer in verse two. And if you have your Bibles open still, you can turn to verse two of 3 John. And this verse says this. It's a simple prayer. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. 
There's three things in that prayer. It's a beautiful prayer. I pray that you may enjoy good health. I'm going to pray for your physical health, for your physical body. I'm going to pray that all may go well with you, that your whole life will be guided by God and will be blessed. And I will pray that it will be well with your soul. That you'll, that as a Christian, that you'll know and love and walk with Jesus. That's a beautiful prayer. How should, how should husbands and wives pray for each other? Lord, I pray that they will have health. I, I pray that their life will go well and you'll bless their life. And I pray that it's well with their soul, that they will know and love and walk with Jesus. If they know Jesus, they'll grow in faith. If they don't, oh Lord, I pray that my spouse will come to know Jesus. How should parents pray for their children? I got an idea. How about this? Lord, I pray for health, for the health of their bodies. I pray for all of their life. And I pray it will go well with their soul. That my son, that my daughter, that my grandchildren will love and know and walk with Jesus. That simple, beautiful prayer can lead us forward and guide us as we pray for people. I hope that many of you will pray that prayer for me and for the other staff members at Shoreline Church, for our leadership team members. You go on the website and see, look at the pictures and just say, Lord, I pray for each one of our staff members, each one of our L team members, these, these people that God has called to lead this church. I pray that, that you will watch over their bodies and protect them and give them health. I pray that it will go well with the, all of their life. It will go well. Watch over their life and each detail of their life. And Lord, I pray it will be well with their soul, that they will love and walk with Jesus. How should we pray? How should we pray for local leaders and national leaders over our country, and global leaders. Can I tell you how we should pray? Watch this now. We should actually pray. <laughs> we should actually pray. Let's start there, okay? I think we spend a lot of time watching, talking about, and worrying about local, national, and global events. Lots of hours watching, lots of hours talking about, and lots of hours stewing and worrying about. Could you imagine on a global level if every Christian spent the time that they spend worrying about national, uh, local, national, and global issues. If they spent the time they spent worrying actually praying. It would, do you believe in the power of prayer? I do. I believe God hears our prayers. And, and, and so, and, and, and can, I give you, can I give you a guarantee and a promise? I'll give you a guarantee and a promise. If you live long enough, there will be people with political influence that you don't agree with. Am I getting risky here? Is that pretty risky to say that? Okay, I mean, in a lifetime, the pendulum swings. Okay, I'll pray for leaders when I agree with them. But I won't pray with, for them when I disagree with them. You know, in the scriptures where, in the, in the first century, when God's church was called to pray for those in roles of authority on a national level, those people in roles of authority in the Roman, Roman government at that time were beyond description in their paganism and in their anger and in their attack on the church. Okay, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. Most of us, okay, people I agree with, people I disagree with. Most of us aren't praying anywhere in the continuum. <laughs> Some of us pray on our side of the, of the pendulum. But I don't think that that's the, that choice isn't ours. To say, oh God, Oh, God, will you lead and guide and watch over? And, oh, boy, we better pray for wisdom, man. We better pray for wisdom for our leaders. Pray for gracious hearts. Pray, pray for love and pray for truth. Amen. And where do we, how do we pray for people in times of trouble? You know, I, I was so blessed when Pastor Roy led us today in prayer for the, 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 this, this congregation, the, the, this, this Jewish synagogue, where 11 people were killed, where six people were injured. Do you know what they were doing when they, about 150 people gathered from three different congregations? You know what they were gathered for? They would, they would gather for basically what we, this, this infant dedication we did. It was, it was a naming ceremony. They were gathered to celebrate a child. It would be like somebody walking in here in the midst of this beautiful moment. I know some of you were peeking during the prayer, which is okay. I'm watching the screens of these, just these little beautiful children. And we're praying for God to bless them and watch over them. In the midst of that, somebody breaks in. It just devastates when, when you heard about that, how'd you respond? Up, oh, that's our month's tragedy. Check. You know, do, do, we, do we get, Lord, may we never get so used to tragedy, it just kind of goes by us. Oh, it's another tragedy. I wonder if in those moments, if we would just fall on our faces and say, oh God, I don't know these people, I don't know their story, but will you surround them, and will you love them, and will you sustain them? Will you, will you watch over them? That community, 
our nation, our world. Open the door to pray. And when something comes up, just stop and pray. When, when, when you're, if, if, if you've watched 15 or 20 minutes of news about all the stuff in the world, then, then turn off the TV, turn off the computer, and get on your knees for 15 or 20 minutes and pray for our world. And watch what happens in you and in our world. There's power in prayer. So we've got to open the door to prayer. Number two, big lesson from a small book, number two. There are times to call out discipline and rebuke. Diotrephes, this man in this church, he, he's out of line. And John says, we're going to deal with it. He says, there's love, but there's also truth. So look what he says in verse 10 of 3 John. So when I come, I love this. It's so beautifully put. I will call attention to what he's doing. I love it. I'm going to call attention to it. We're going to, we're going to have a conversation. We're going to talk about it, right? He's spreading malicious nonsense about us, lies, rumors. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers, no hospitality, and he also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. If somebody wants to offer hospitality to Christians traveling through, this guy, Diotrephes, is standing in the way saying, you can't do it or you're thrown out of the church. Man, that's harshness. And so John says, we're going to confront it. We're going to deal with it. We're going to have a hard conversation. This last Wednesday in our staff meeting, uh, Kim McDonald, who's one of, our, one of our church leaders here, and she leads our women's ministry, Kim led our, our teaching time. Talked for about 40 minutes about having hard conversations. She actually said, I want you each to think of one person who you need to have a hard conversation with. And she gave us some skills and tools out of a book called hard, Difficult Conversations. Great teaching, great encouragement for us. And as I was thinking about that and thinking about some, some hard conversations I may need to have, though I love people, if I truly love people, I'll have the hard conversations. This, this memory came to my mind of uh, about, about eight or nine years ago. Sherry and I, we go back to Michigan every summer uh, for, uh, for about two weeks and spend time with her family and with friends. And I was in Michigan some years ago, and I got a call from a friend and said, hey, I've got, a, I've got a guy that you kind of, an acquaintance, he said, he's invited us to go golfing at his golf course. It's a beautiful golf course. And this guy's like a, like a scratch golfer. He can play even, he plays almost like a pro, just beautiful golf. And this guy wants to host us at his golf course, at this beautiful golf course. I said, I'm in. So I went over, we played, and this guy, I mean, this is a guy, he would hit a golf ball, now watch this, if the fairway goes, went like this and bent this way, he'd hit a golf ball, just as smooth, barely, smooth, made this really funny sound that was just so pure, and the ball would go like exactly the way he wanted it to go, it was really interesting to watch. Um, if he, if he wanted the ball to go this way, he'd go this way, he'd want to go that way, and he just, and he just beautiful shot after beautiful shot, like five, six holes in the round, he's like one under par, and, and then we get on a hole, like fifth, sixth hole, gets over a ball, an iron shot, takes a shot. Doesn't make the beautiful sound. Doesn't go right where he wants it to go. And a river of filth came out of his mouth that I can't repeat here. And after he had just stomped around like an angry three-year-old and just cussed, like, anyways, he grabbed his iron and he started beating his golf bag. And then he threw the iron. And I thought, this went through my mind. That is not good behavior for a pastor. True story. Uh, so we finished, and, and at that point, my round of golf was, was done. I was done. I played the rest of the round, but I was done. I, I, I just can't. Uh, it had, there, people can get their own. When you throw a club and it leaves your hands, I know the next time it happens, it could hit me, and I just, my mind was off the round of golf. Finished the round, and inside of me, I, I was praying, is this a moment for a difficult conversation? He's an acquaintance. He's a pastor. And I prayed, Lord, should I confront him and have a conversation? And I felt like God said, that's not your place. So I didn't. Then I have a problem with that. Moved on. A couple years later, I get a phone call. It's this guy. He's an acquaintance. Hey, hey, Kevin, how you doing? I said, oh, yeah. And I kind of, oh, yeah, I got back to who it was. Yeah, yeah. And he says, listen, I'm coming to Monterey. <laughs> and I'm bringing my golf clubs. And I know you know people around the peninsula at your church that are members of some nice courses. Could you set me up to play golf at some good courses when I come to town? We're over here now. Uh, I said, absolutely not. What? 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 Why? I said, I said, do you remember the last time we golfed together at your course? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, that was fun. And I said, do you remember about the fifth or sixth hole when you miss, hit, missed a shot? Do you remember what happened? He didn't remember any of it. I think it's because it happened so often. It didn't seem out of place to him. And so I recounted for him what happened and what he said and what he did and how he behaved. And I said, I would never ask anyone to host you at their golf course because I would never invite someone to, to, to put up with that. 
And, he, and, and his response was like, well, yeah, oh, yeah, I, I know, sometimes I kind of lose it, but you know, it's not, and he just kind of blew it off. And so we kind of ended the conversation, and I said no. And a couple years later, I get a letter, an email, just long, long email from him. I need to ask for your forgiveness. I've had a number of people in my life, you, you and others who have confronted me, and I fought it off, but he says, I begin to watch my son and how he behaves when he golfs, and it's exactly like me, and it's not good. He said, I'm in counseling, I'm working on it, and I'm dealing with it. But he said, thank you for telling me the truth when you told me the truth. Sometimes we have to open the door to truth. And John is saying, when Diotrephes comes into town, or when I get into town, we're going to have a truthful conversation about his behavior because it needs to change. We have to have those conversations. If we love people in the truth, sometimes we open the door for truthful, tough conversations. Third lesson from this small book. Big lesson from small book number three. There are times to speak well of people. There are times where, where God would want us just to speak words of blessing about people. Look with me at verse 12. Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone. They're in the habit of speaking well of him and even by the truth itself. We also speak well of him and you know that our testimony is true. We need to become the kind of people who open the door to speak words of blessing about other people. Listen closely. When they're not there. Speaking well. Now, now sometimes, sometimes we're known for what we say about people when they're not there. Sometimes we're known for that, but it's not positive. We have to be known as those who are speaking well. We open the door. To, if, if there's someone we can speak well of, we can bless. And if there's somebody we can't speak well of, we should probably close the door of our mouth. You know, husbands, if your wife heard what you say about her to your friends... Would she say, oh, how he loves and honors me? Or would she say, I never thought he thought that way about me? Wives, if your husband heard what you say about him to other people, would he say, oh, she blesses me. She loves me. She honors me as her, as, you know, as her, as her spouse, as her closest friend. Or, or, or would you say, I didn't know she talked that way about me. I didn't know she thought that way about me. Kids, what do you say about your parents? We, we need to open the door to speak blessing about our church. I would hope, I would hope about our pastors, about our friends. And if, what, if when we open our mouth, what flows out is just bitterness and criticism. We have to say, Lord, help me understand, is this, is this bringing life? But I love one of the doors that opens is a door of a mouth that speaks words of blessing. Big lessons from a small book, number four. Fourth lesson. There are times to open the door of, our, of your heart and your home. There's times where we have to just show good old-fashioned hospitality. As a church in our personal lives, we have to open the door and say, come on in. One of the things I love about Shoreline Church is that Howie Hugo and Linda Hugo and the team that started this church, they built this church on a passion for hospitality. We have enough breakfast for about 2,000 people every week. And, 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 and even though there's 2,000 people, sometimes the food's gone for 2,500. I don't know what's going on there, but maybe you're getting donuts on the way in and way out. I'm not sure. But, that, but there's, that's not what the sermon's about. But, there, but, there, but that's part of the heart of this church. When you come in the parking lot, there's people there to greet you. Not to boss you around, but to say, good morning, how you doing? I help you find a spot. When you walk in, there's people, that, we have hospitality. There's people that, that were here early before the first service, getting donuts and tea and coffee and cutting fresh fruit to serve you and show hospitality. For some of you, you're, you've been thinking, i got to find a place to help out at Shoreline. Why not check out our hospitality ministry? It's, it's parking lot ministry, a greeter ministry, usher ministry, uh, in the kitchen, all the food. There's just but, uh, lots of ways that we do hospitality. Just go by the Connection Center after the service and go, go to say, where's Patty? Say, Patty, can you tell me more about hospitality? Because it, it sends a message. And this is the heart of Jesus. I, I love in verse 7 of, of 3 John. It was for the sake of the name that they went out. These are Christians that are going out to share about Jesus, receiving no help from the pagans. They weren't getting support, housing, food. But we, he says, we ought therefore to show hospitality to such people so that we, we may work together for the truth. We need to say, God, Open the door of hospitality in my home, in my life, in my church. Let me share freely what you've given to me. And, and, and are, are there times when you close the door? Well, we read 2 John last week, and he says, man, there's people traveling that aren't preaching Jesus. They're against Jesus. Okay, close the door. Do, do it. 
kindly, but you close that door. But man, when we can, we open the door. And you know what? We can take little acts of hospitality with us and wherever we go. You're in the parking lot. Come, come, you know, coming, coming or leaving. Second service particularly can be a little intense coming in and out with parking, that kind of thing. And so, so, like if you may, so, so I would encourage you, make gestures to other drivers. But make a gesture like this. No, no, please. You first. <laughs> See, that kind, that kind of gesture. Make this gesture. Hi. Nice to, I don't know you, but hello. You know, that, Hospitality. When someone comes in with a family of three or four, and maybe they're coming a little bit late, and there's, there's three or four seats in your row, but they're scattered out, just, just do this. Oh, come on. Well, come, hey, let's all move, and we move our stuff, and come on, come join us. Versus late again. Um, you know, <laughs> open the door, right? This little book of Third John says to us, open the door of prayer. Pray more than you've ever prayed before. Man, when you're, when you're tense, when you're anxious, when things are going on, say, man, I could be anxious and wound up, or I can seek the face of God in prayer. Open the door to truth. Sometimes you have those difficult conversations, but you do it in love. Open the door to blessing. Am I speaking words of blessing about people when they're not there? And if they could hear what I'm saying, they would be delighted. Open the door to hospitality. Oh, God, we thank you that through Jesus Christ, you've opened the door to us. You've opened the door to heaven. You've opened the door to hope. And we pray that we would be people who walk in love and walk in truth. And every time we can, with responsibility and goodness, open the door. Let us do so for your glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.